Okay, any questions? Do you understand how I got here? Do you understand the linearization part and the perturbation equations? Okay, please go home and review up to this point because from now on it's going to be the rep I'm going to repeat what we have done. I'm just going to write down the equations. So please uh, review how we got here. Okay, so that later on there's no ambiguity about what this equation really is about. This is our perturbation equations. We want to get the perturbations back to zero so that the system is stable. All right? So this is the first equation. Well, let me summarize these equations. Maybe that's the best way to do it. This is the first equation, right? This is the first translational equation. I already wrote the other ones. But let me, let me just summarize it. And when we summarize it, I'm going to do one more assumption to make things easier. Um, we are going to say the angle of attack, angle of attack, attack in steady level flight, flight is small, which means W zero is close to zero, okay? So this is just to make the equations a little simpler. You don't have to do that if um, in some equations, in some books, you will see this not equal zero, okay? Then this term will be there, but if it's equal to zero, then this term will disappear. Since we are just doing an exercise here in class to see how we are obtaining equations, I'm just gonna assume it to be zero because it's small. If you look at an airplane flying at 800, 900 kilometers per hour in steady level flight, the angle of attack is quite a small number. Okay? So because it's a small number, you multiply it with this perturbation. You multiply it with this perturbation and then you get a small number. But as I said, when I make an assumption, it doesn't mean that you have, if the angle of attack is large, you cannot make that assumption, okay? So whenever I make an assumption, don't think that I'm trying to cheat or anything. It's just that for most airplanes, it's small. And if it's not small, it has to be there. But since we are doing an exercise here in class, I'm trying to show you things. If it's not small, you just have to keep it in your equation. So for now, I'm going to make that small assumption so that the equations will be a little simpler and we are writing a little less. Is that good? Okay. So as a summary, then we have this. Del u dot is equal to del x divided by m minus g uh, cosine theta zero times delta theta. That is this first equation, okay? Assuming that the angle of attack in trim is small. Is that good? So if you would do the same thing, linearize or do small perturbation, you would obtain, what would you obtain? V dot, the second one, del y divided by m plus g cosine theta phi times, I'm just going to write, let's write delta phi, okay, minus u0 times r. So now I'm kind of mixing and matching things. For instance, look at r. Del r is equal to r minus r0. In trim, r0 is 0 and therefore del r is equal to r, right? Sorry. Yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. This one here, right? Okay. This is a phi and this is a theta zero. Okay. And since del r is equal to r minus r zero, this would be equal to zero and therefore delta r is r. So I'm writing an r, but I know that this is a perturbation equation. So I could have written the same equation like this. Del v dot is equal to del y divided by m plus g cos theta zero times delta phi minus u zero times del r. So it would be the same. 
it is still a perturbation equation because this is equal to that, this is equal to that, that's that. Even for phi, for example, instead of delta phi, I could have written is equal to phi. Wouldn't have made a difference. Understand? So from now on, I can just write these things, even this one here, right? This is equal to V dot. So from now on, I can write these linear equations any way I want. Always remember, it is still a perturbation equation. Okay? Just because you see real numbers here, like V, you know, a phi or an R, doesn't make it a non-perturbation equation. It is still a perturbation equation. The reason I'm just writing it like that is because the perturbations are... Uh, it is pertur perturbed around zero, that's why, right? So I could still write this, V dot is equal to del Y divided by M plus G cos theta zero phi minus U zero times R. You have phi, you have R, you have V dot. Is that a perturbation equation? Yes, it is still a perturbation equation because it is perturbed around zero. Fine? Okay, so this is the second one, this is the first one. Okay, the third one would look like this. W dot is equal to del Z divided by M minus G sine theta zero delta theta plus u0 times q. So that would be the third one. Still a perturbation equation. Or a linear, linearized equation, whatever you want to call. Is that fine? Let me just move this a little up here. <coughs> okay, so you have these three equations now. Now we can do the same thing for the p dot q dot r dot equation, but remember the p dot q dot r dot equation was not easy to obtain because it was looked like that, remember? But if you assume uh, uh, an airplane that, is, that has a symmetry axis, which means x, y and y, z, i, x, y and i, y, z are equal to zero, then you can obtain a simpler equation that kind of looks like this, remember? So what we are going to do here is, we are going to assume i x y is equal to i um, y z, and that's equal to zero. But i x z, I'm going to keep in that equation, we are going to say it is not equal to zero, okay? because for most airplanes it's not really equal to zero. But if it's a, if it's a symmetric plane, this is absolutely zero. Right? So, if you do the linearization or the perturbation that I've done in the first lecture, you should obtain something like that. For P dot, you can also linearize this. You will get Ix, Iz, minus Ix, z square over minus 1, iz delta l plus ixz times delta n. And I just want to caution you that what I'm writing here is ix is equal to ixx, okay, I'm just writing this for short, so iz would be equal to izz. So, just to write it short from now on, I'm just going to write Ix and Iz and Iy, all right? It's changing the notation a little bit. Or you can also say Iy is equal to Iyy. Okay? So, this is the P dot equation. The Q dot equation, the linearized Q dot equation, is equal to delta M divided by de Iy. And the R dot equation is equal to Ix, Iz, Ix, Z square over minus 1, Iz, X delta L plus Ix delta 
n, still a perturbation equation. So you have three more equations. Three more equations, okay? And these are the rotational dynamics. Question, are these equations, are these equations, um, oh, I'm missing, uh, there's, a, there's a parenthesis here, sorry. Okay, there's a parenthesis I was missing. Are these two equations linear equations, linearized equations? Is the, is the, is the right-hand side of the equation a linear equation? Yes. yes, because this is a number, right? Ix, Iz, Ixz, these are numbers. So it will be something like four, five, hundred, one thousand, whatever. It will be a number. This is a number. So multiply this number with this number. You get delta L, which is the perturbation in the, in the moment and you get delta n perturbation in the moment, you multiply this one, this one will still be a number. So it will be something like p dot is equal to a number times delta l plus a number times delta n, so it is a linear equation. It looks nonlinear, but it's not. Understand? Because these are just numbers here. They are inertial, in, they're, they are the, they're product of inertia, moments of inertia, and things like this. So how many equations do we have by now? We have now six equations, six Linearized equations, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? If you recall our equations, we still have theta and phi as variables in these equations. I mean, look at this. We have still theta, and here we have phi as our variables. And we know phi and theta, they are related to P, Q, and R, right? So we need three more equations that will relate P, Q, and R into theta, phi, and psi. And this is how we do this. If you remember, we had um, um, we said phi dot, theta dot, and psi dot were equal to some relation. If we took the inverse of that, which was a function of theta and phi, and they were functions of p, q, and r. Remember that, right? We obtained this relation a few weeks ago. So you can, this, is, this was nonlinear, if you recall, there was tangents and seconds and things like this in this equation. And remember, because of the tangent, uh, it, it would go to infinity when theta is equal to zero and all this story, right? So what we can do now is we can linearize this part as well. And you would obtain like a perturbation equation once again. You can write this as perturbations. I mean, what happens to theta dot, phi dot, and psi dot when I perturb P, Q, and R? That's the question I'm asking here, okay? So if you write perturbations to all these numbers, I mean, it might take quite some time. I'm just going to write the result. You will get this one. Theta dot would be equal to delta Q, delta phi dot, would be equal to p plus r times tangent theta zero, and delta psi dot would be equal to r times second theta zero, okay? So these would be, again, your linear equations. Is that okay now? Sorry. Okay. So that looks fine. How many equations did we linearize so far now? How many? Three? How come three? I linearized, how many equations did I linearize? Nine, right? I linearized the translational dynamics, u dot, v dot, w dot equation. Although this looks like a delta u dot, this looks like a v dot, this is still delta v dot, and this is still u dot, right? Okay? And then I linearized p dot, q dot, r dot, still we can write delta p dot, delta q dot, these are still perturbation equations, okay? And then I linearize these three. 
So now I have nine linearized equations. Can I write them in matrix form? Yes. Can I look at the eigenvalues and look at stability? Yes, we can do that. But there's one more little problem here. See, the problems, they never end. There's one more little problem. Look at this equation now. This was the first equation we obtained. What makes this an airplane? I mean, so far there was nothing about an airplane, right? Not too much. What makes this an airplane? The delta x, right? The delta x is the perturbation of the aircraft around the equilibrium point, and it is the aeropropulsive force. What does it mean it's aeropropulsive? What is in the aeropropulsive force? There is lift, drag, thrust. Good. What is lift and drag a function of? Angle of attack. What else? Velocity. Planform area, but let's say you have a fixed airplane, so it's constant. How about side slip? Will it change? Will the lift change if you have a little side slip of the airplane, of the whole airplane? The lift, the drag, it will all change, right? So, X the aeropropulsive force is really a function of the other variables of angle of attack, of velocity, of other things. So I cannot leave delta x like this over here. Delta x is also a function of other things. So delta s, x, if you look at this, it's a function of a function and basically if we have delta x, but delta x is a function of other things and we don't have that relation in our equations. I know theta is a function of p, q and r and I know the relation between p, q and r and delta and so on and so forth. Over here I have, for example, r. I know r, you know, I have the r dot equation, but delta x, delta y, delta z, Actually, delta L, delta M, and N, these are all functions, the aeropropulsive function, are functions of the, still, of the other variables. So I need to enter them into my equation. For instance, let me, let's talk about delta X. I mean, let's, let's start with this equation, right? We had del U dot is equal to del X divided by M minus G cos theta zero times theta delta theta, right? That, that's my equation. So let me just put a little line here now. That's my equation. Okay, but delta x is a function of, is it a function of forward speed? Body x axis forward speed. Could it be a function of that? Yes or no? Why not? Let's, let's look at this. Airplane. V infinity and that's X body and this is Z body and this is Y body. All right. Now question is, is delta X, what is delta X? This is delta X. This is X, the perturbation of X. Will it be a function of u? In other words, if the velocity at in the x body direction changes, will this x force change? Yes, of course, because you change the velocity. Because the velocity change, you will change drag. And because of the drag change, x will change. In fact, if you have a turbojet engine, your velocity will change. And because of the change in velocity, your thrust will change as well. Right? So definitely because of u, x will change. So delta x is a function of u. Imagine an airplane in, 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 in forward flight. Okay? Suddenly you go, the, the velocity in x is changing a little bit. A perturbation in x. It will also cause a perturbation, I, th I'm sorry, a perturbation in u will cause a perturbation in x, isn't it? How about, let's start with what else? W. W is this velocity, right? If I change this, if this velocity is changing, will this x also change? 
Well, W is directly connected to angle of attack, right? So there's a one-to-one -one relation. So if, if W changes, it means angle of attack is changing. If angle of attack is changing, will this X change? Yes, so of course. W, delta X is a function of W. So if W changes, delta X will change. What else? How about <coughs> Q? Now I'm asking difficult questions. How about Q? If, if you have an angular rate, you have an angular rate, suddenly a little angular rate. Do you think there will be a change in lift and drag? Hmm? There should be, I mean there should be something. You know when we write the lift formula, that's a little funny. When we write the lift formula, we always have this... So, how should I say? When we write the lift formula, we always have this pretty picture. We always say, oh, here's my airplane. This is V infinity. I have V infinity. And then, therefore, uh, this is uh, 90 degrees. This is lift and this is drag. Right? This is what we say. Now, if the airplane goes into this flight condition, let's say it changes its attitude, and then we say, okay, Change it, stop. Now calculate lift. And then we look at lift angle of attack and you have your new lift and your new drag. Right? But what happens in between? At each time instant we say stop. Let me calculate lift. V infinity alpha. Stop. We calculate lift, drag. A little bit more angle. Stop. We calculate lift and drag. Now we call this, what we are doing, we call it a quasi-steady assumption. We call it a quasi-steady assumption. Quasi-steady assumption. Which means, at each instant of time, we are assuming V infinity is coming like that, there is an alpha and we calculate lift and drag. At the next instant, we assume as, as if everything is steady, and then we do this and we assume everything is steady which is not really true. Because when you're doing this, let's, let me, let, let's do it fast, there's absolutely, there's no, st at each instant in time, there's no steady flow. There's an unsteadiness, right? I mean, when I do this, the air goes up and down, I hear waves and lots of things. So it's unsteady, isn't it? This is only true, calculate lift, drag, lift, drag, lift, drag, lift, drag, at each instant is only true when, when the air flow is steady. But if I do this, and I stop the picture here, calculate lift, well, the lift is, I cannot make that assumption that the, 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 the air is smooth here now, or the, 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 the air flow is steady. But the lift formula that we have, 1 over 2 rho v squared CL alpha and all this, assumes steady airflow. So what I'm trying to say is that if the airplane does a stall fast Q, this is a Q, right, angular pitch rate. If the pitch rate is fast, I cannot really make that assumption that lift is equal to 1 over 2 rho v square blah blah. That is only true if the airplane's movement is slow. Right? Because at each instant in time I assume the airflow is settling down so fast that I can make that assumption that lift is equal to 1 over 2 rho v square because that assumes v infinity and everything is steady. Right? So if the airplane does a fast Q like that the angle of attack is not really a constant angle of attack. There is a certain alpha dot that affects the lift, which is not in our lift equation. So the lift equation, 1 over 2 rho v squared CL, all that, that is only true if we assume a steady flow. So therefore we do a quasi-steady assumption. Okay? So coming back to this, is the drag, for example, a function of Q? Well, if you look at the drag formula, it looks like it's not because it's only 1 over 2 rho v square cd times area and so on and so forth, right? So it seems like it's not a function of the pitch rate. But if the pitch, that's only true if the pitch rate is small. If the pitch rate is large, in fact, lift and drag will be a function of q. It's just not reflected in your lift formula or in your drag formula. Understand my point? So in reality, I could say it is not a function of q, but believe me, it is. Okay? When you have a large Q, you're pushing all this air upwards, 
Okay? At each instant, you're changing the angle of attack and your velocity and all this, but the, the air is also pushed up and down. You have wakes, you have turbulence, you have all sorts of separation, lots of things. So lift and drag will definitely be affected by Q. Does that make sense? It's just not captured in your lift formula, 1 over 2 rho v squared, because that assumes constant v, steady flow. And steady flow is not necessarily what happens when you do this in the air. Does that make sense? Okay, so it is a function of q, I can tell you. All right, what else? How about, um, okay. What did we write? We, we did write it's a function of Q, V, and, and so forth. Okay, how about uh, P? Will it be a function of P? Rho, the lift and drag. No, maybe a little bit? Because you're doing this, could there be a little bit of drag because of this? Because you're pushing air? Absolutely no, absolute zero. If you put it in the wind tunnel, you give it a roll, and you will not see any change in lift and drag? Well, I would say there is not much. But there's a little bit, right? Just a little. It's not exactly zero, right? There's some effect of P. There must be some effect. I mean, if I know aerodynamics, or if I know the behavior of the air, I would never say it is exactly equal to zero. There's some of it. It is small. It's okay, so you can make that assumption it is small. I agree with that. But don't tell me it is absolutely zero. There is absolutely no effect. There's some effect, but it's small, right? How about R? Same thing. It's probably small, but there could be. What else? Side velocity. How about that? Side slip. Yeah, it's maybe small, maybe not. You know, but it is not exactly zero, right? Okay, what else? What else will affect delta x? How about thrust? If the pilot gives a thrust input, will that affect x? Probably, so the thrust. So what I'm trying to say is basically, a lot of things will affect this delta x. What else, for example, changing the ailerons? will affect, right, change ailerons, or the elevator, change the elevator. It will co cause a little bit more drag, a little bit more lift. It will change a lot in the moment, but it will also change a little bit of the drag. So the pilot controls, let's just call them pilot controls. That will all affect those things. And maybe many others. For example, how about V dot? Um, let's say U dot, the acceleration. Will U dot affect X? I mean, U is affecting X for sure because of the drag, but how about U dot? Let's say you have an acceleration. Will that affect delta X? Probably too. How about U double dot then? Am I asking for too much? How about triple dot? Basically, everything is affecting delta X. Okay? Even if it's a little bit, it will affect. So what are we going to do? We, as engineers, we are good at making approximations, right? We are going to choose the ones that are making sense, and we are going to move from there, and hopefully our equations that we built will be good enough to generate this thing. So, let's just say, let's just say, um, let's, let's make it a meaningful one, right? Let's, let's, Start with a meaningful one. Let's say del x is definitely a function of u and w, okay, and um, what else can we do? And uh, the, the, the thrust, right? Let's, let's assume it like that for a second. Okay, this is a function of that. And this is a perturbation, and this is a function. How do I make that, how do I linearize this function now? This is a perturbation equation, and this is not right now a perturbation, um, right? We don't know what this looks like. This, is a, this could be a, quite a complex function. I mean, you change u a little bit, you change w a little bit, and you get a lot of del x. So we don't know that, that function. 
So what I'm suggesting is let's make this function also a perturbation equation. In other words, let's linearize it as well. If you linearize it, what do you get? You'll get this. <laughs> Actually, how can I do this? I could, um, oh, well, let me first linearize, okay. Del x, del u, will be u minus u0, plus del x, del w, w minus w0, plus del x, del delta t, times delta t, sorry, minus delta t0. Okay. How did I come to this idea? Well, you might want to think of it like this. X is equal to X0 plus delta X, right? Is that right? So, I mean, forget about this delta x. Let's, let's just think of this. x is a function of f u w delta t. Okay? So, but I'm, I need this for my equations. I don't have that. I need this for my equations, right? I mean, in all my equations, I have this. Look at my del u dot. I have delta x. I need the perturbation. I don't need the whole x. So if x is a function of that, then I really need this part of my perturbation. So you could actually write this one. Maybe this makes more sense. x uh, to, to write. x is equal to x0 plus this delta x, which is this part. Right? It will be del x del u, u minus u0, plus del x del w, w minus w0, plus del x del delta t, delta t minus delta t0. So, and this part here is delta x. And this is what I have here. So, in a way, x is a function of these things, but you could also say that x delta x is a function of these things, but I think this is easier to understand, isn't it? Does it make more sense? x is a function of these things, so therefore x is equal to x0 plus delta x, but I need delta x for my equations, so delta x will be this part, which is simply that. Is that good? Too confusing? Understand it or not? I mean, I keep doing the same thing. I'm just showing things around. And I, 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 I can imagine that you're not used to this. Um, so as a result, del x here here is del x del u times delta u plus del x del w times delta w plus del x del t times delta del t. So now I have to go and write this into my perturbation equation. You see? If I write this now into right into perturbation equation, right into perturbation equation, perturbation equation, then I get something like this. Del u dot here is equal to this part, right? This part. Sorry. I'm going to write this into this perturbation equation now since I know del x, right? So it will be 1 over m, this part here, del x del u times delta u 
plus del x del w plus del w plus del x del delta t times delta delta t minus g cos theta 0 times theta 0. Now this is what my perturbation equation really looks like now. And this part here is del x. Does it make sense? And because del x is a function of delta u, delta w, and delta pilot control thrust, whatever. Now the perturbation equation, the linearization equation, becomes actually something bigger because delta x was a function of u, w, and delta d from the beginning, right? I just didn't mention it too much. But I have to write this delta x in terms of the other variables, and then I have actually the change in delta u dot. So in other words, what happens now is, if you have a forward speed for a perturbation in your forward speed, okay, if you just go faster, let's say, it's going to affect x, and it will be in that equation now. Because in the previous equation, I mean, it was in that equation, it was obvious, like, if you go a little bit faster, if you perturb the system into a little bit faster, delta x would change, and therefore delta u dot would change. And now I have it in the equation here, if x is going, if, if the airplane is going a little bit faster, it will be now here, because of that, delta x will change, and therefore delta u dot will change, I mean, if you go a little faster because of x, okay? So what, what we are trying to do is we take airplane, look up here real quick, we take the airplane, we, put, we per, perturb it in every direction in terms of angles and translational dynamics. And then we see what happens after that. If all perturbations go back to zero, then we are, are in stable flight, right? Now, Remember, all perturbations also affect the forces and moments because if you go a little faster, you have more drag. If you increase angle of attack, you get more lift and all these things. And those will again turn back and affect accelerations and angular velocities and things like that, angular accelerations. And then we are seeing if everything will go back. So instead of this delta x, I have to write that perturbation equation because delta x is affected by these numbers. Does that make sense? Okay, so one more thing about the notation. Since I'm going to write a lot of these numbers here, we are going to make a change in notation. Instead of del x del u, I want to write simply x u. And x u does mean del x del u. Okay, from now on something like that means a partial derivative. It is the change of x because of u. So that's what a partial derivative means, right? Everything else is constant. If I just change u, how will x change? That's what a partial derivative is. So del x del u, I'm just going to write it as x u. That will mean del x del u. So this one here, that would be x w. Okay? So this is, this is the, the notation I will be using and that we are using in in, um, in flight mechanics and in aerodynamics, a small w means this is a partial derivative, okay? And this one here would be x delta t, so that would be del x del delta t. It would mean this. Is that okay? So from now on, these will be the partial derivatives to use. So, it is the partial derivative that says what happens to x if I change w? What happens to x if I change the thrust input? What happens to x if I change u? And nothing else, if I just change u. Here's my question. If I change u, if I make u bigger, will x be smaller or larger? What do you think? If x becomes larger, uh, if u becomes bigger, will x be bigger or smaller? 
bigger. Why bigger? Because u will be is the fourth velocity, right? The x velocity, the x velocity will become bigger, means that there's probably more drag, and therefore the drag will be bigger, but it will be bigger in the opposite direction, right? X bar is in the front and drag is in the back, so it will probably be bigger towards the back. Is that, is that okay? Okay. So you have to think about it a little bit. What about this one? If W becomes bigger, does it mean the angle of attack is increasing or decreasing? Increasing. So if it's increased, what happened to X? Will it increase or decrease? Or the drag, let's say. Let's talk about the drag, not X. Will drag increase or decrease? Angle of attack, it will increase, right? It will increase towards the back. But X is to the front, so the signs will be accordingly. Okay. Now, every time I say this, someone will tell me, oh, you're increasing u. Okay, there will be x. And because of the drag, it will slow down. And because it will slow down, it will do this. This is not what a partial derivative is. The partial derivative is everything else is constant. I only increase u what happens to x. Okay, that's what a partial derivative is. So, and the moment I in increase u, x will, the drag will increase and x will something. Okay? So, these derivatives, they kind of define now what are they related to. Now, they are related to aerodynamics because how much will x change if you change u is purely related to your design. If you make a slender good aerodynamics, x will probably not change that much because drag will not change much. If you make a bad design, the change in U might cause the drag to change a lot. So X will change a lot. So these are purely related to your specific airplane. Remember the equations so far were, were not specific to airplanes, right? I mean, not to a specific airplane. It could be applied to every airplane. It seems like the equations were used for every airplane. What is changing from airplane to airplane are now these derivatives. Everything else is pretty much constant. I mean the same, not constant, meaning you can use those equations for other airplanes. But these will change. And therefore these variables are very important. They are called aerodynamic derivatives. Okay, aerodynamic derivatives. These numbers are called aerodynamic derivatives and they are so-called our bread and butter in aerospace. Okay, so something like XU, something like XW, something like X delta T. Let me give you another example. How about MQ? What would that be? MQ would be del M del Q. What does it mean? The aerodynamic pitching moment that you obtain because of Q. Q, the aerodynamic pitching rate. So if I would take an airplane, if I would give it a pitch rate only, without changing everything else, if I would just give it a pitch rate, what would be the moment? Not that derivative. Understand? So here's my question. If I give you a Q, what do you expect the moment to be? Would it be in this side? Will it be try to put the nose down or will it try to put the nose back up? So because of this Q, since I have a Q. Hopefully it will be like that, right? If I give a Q, hopefully the aerodynamic moment will be doing this. Hopefully. We don't know that yet, but hopefully it will do that. Because, because of this Q, because of Q, so because of Q, if I have a moment in this direction, then I'm really in a bad situation, and I go like that, right? Bigger Q, bigger M, bigger Q, bigger M, so I'm diverging. So what I want is because of that Q, I want this M. So this del M del Q is a very important number. How about MW, del M del W? Moment because of, because of angle of attack, right? 
moment because of angle of attack. So the airplane is like that. So you have an angle of attack, large angle of attack. You want to have a moment here or here? Hopefully you have a moment like that, right? So that you're coming back. Because if you have a large angle of attack and it becomes larger, you get a moment here, the angle of attack becomes larger and more moment. So this is an, a, another aerodynamic derivative, right? So MW would be an aerodynamic derivative. So all these things, and there are many of them, right? YU, ZW, I don't know, NR, um, LP, all these partial derivatives, there are many of them, they are called, are called, aerodynamic derivatives. And when we go into wind tunnels or we are doing flight tests, usually what we do is we do a lot of things of course there, but we are always trying to estimate these numbers. Imagine you're building a new airplane and you want to look if it's stable or unstable. You need these linearized equations. All these linearized equations have these partial derivatives. So what you need to do is you need to find these partial derivatives. The way you find it, you go into the wind tunnel and do these tests in order to find these aerodynamic derivatives. Another way of finding them is doing CFDs, computational fluid dynamics. I'm, I'm sure you have heard of CFDs, computational fluid dynamics. So we do computational fluid dynamics to find these aerodynamic variables. So if I know these aerodynamic derivatives, then I can actually make the stability analysis because I can put them now into my equations. Okay? CFDs, wind tunnels are used to find those aerodynamic derivatives. Is that okay? If you don't have a CFT tool or don't know how to use it or if you don't have a wind tunnel, you can go and there are some empirical formulas which means if you have an airplane with this much of a wing, this much of a tail, if it's this big, this large, your del x del u should be approximately this number. You know, there are formulas for that too. But that is again a cheap way of finding and they are never very accurate of course. Okay, so let's give a little break and we'll continue.